uh, in Washington, D.C., and I lived with my grandparents for a number of years. And this is what I remember from them. You can hear me? Oh, you can hear me. Okay. I grew up with my grandparents for a few years, and this is what I remember from living with them. I love to draw and color, so I would find whatever kind of cardboard box or the, the, the cards inside of men's shirts when they came from the, the Chinese laundry, and I would draw on those things. So one day, I did this drawing, and I imagined a wedding. And it was a couple, and the woman had a purple and turquoise dress. And the man was wearing a black top hat, kind of like, who was that, Lincoln? I don't know, did Lincoln, President Lincoln, wear a top hat, a big top hat? And I was really proud of my drawing, and I, and I read to my grandparents and showed them my drawing. And they said, what is this? What did you do? And I was, you know, they were shocked. I didn't know why they were shocked. And they said, you drew a Jewish wedding. <laughs> and I, I was hurt because I didn't care what religion it was. I didn't know what church it was. I did, I, it was just my imaginary wedding. And it was a beautiful picture, and I wanted them to like it, and they, they criticized me because I had seen something different. I was using imagination. And that lesson, I think I was seven, and that lesson sort of stayed with me, and I realized I saw things differently. And I had to embrace that different vision because that was me, and that was how I saw the world. So at a pretty early age, I realized I see things differently. And I'm just going to have to accept it and embrace it and just be myself and not care if people criticize. <laughs> so that was my first, my first lesson there. Um, a few years later, when I was in school, my mother wanted me to take typing. And I didn't really want to take typing. She was a secretary, and she wanted me to take typing. I said, later, Mom. I signed up for art classes, and I wanted to sing in the high school choir because the high school choir got to sing in the National Cathedral in Washington, D.C. And I wanted to go sing in the National Cathedral. So I refused, and I took the choir, and my mother was upset with me, but you know what? The National Cathedral was awesome. It was an amazing experience. I was up in the high, I don't know what you call it, in the cathedral, where the choir is singing down on all these people. <laughs> It was breathtaking. I learned typing eventually. It wasn't important enough, but I learned it. And I realized I had to know my own mind, and I had to make my own decisions. So that was one of my other lessons. <laughs> that was pretty early. The next thing that I remember is I met this man from Rusinga Island. And he was a really good dancer. Anyway, he swept me off my feet, and I wanted to take him home to, to meet my parents. How bold was that? It was 1963, 64, somewhere in there. Fearlessly, I took him home to meet my parents. And of course, you can imagine what their reaction was. Oh my God, they were not nice. They made nasty comments. One of the things they said to me was, if you marry that man, your children are going to have pink hands and feet. And I looked at my hands, I looked at my feet, and I said, well, geez, I've got pink hands and feet, so what's that all about? I realized I had to know my own heart, make my own decisions. I wasn't going to please everybody. And I realized I didn't care about the color of the person. I cared about their goodness and their character. So I had to decide that and carry that one with me, carry it forward into the rest of my life, living with that kind of decision. I just had to choose what I thought was right. So a few years later, five to be exact, um, he was murdered in Kansas City. And I, by, by some gang members, they wanted to rob him. And I don't know what happened. I wasn't with him at the time, thank, thank goodness. But um, they killed him. And 
I thought I was also going to die. But at the moment, I had a baby, and I had to take care of that baby, so I couldn't let myself die. I had to just persist and be strong and develop strength I never knew I had. So I, um, I just accepted the, the aid from my friends and support from my church people, and different people came to help me. Uh, Tom Boya raised money to help me send the body back home. So I came and brought him to Brasinga, and I missed the actual burial, but I did get here in time. I got here in time, basically, to bury him. And I promised Tom that I would come back. And it was kind of a, <laughs> a you know, sort of an off-the-cuff thing. Yes, Tom, I'm coming back. I promise I'm coming back. And I, re I realized later that it was going to be a real chore coming back. But I said I was going to, and I believe in commitment, so I had to do it. So I sort of prepared myself mentally that I was going to come back. So one of the things I needed to do was finish my school. So uh, I started on a course of uh, a BA degree, and it took me 10 years. And then I started on a course of a master's degree, and it took me another five years. All the while, I was a mother. I worked. I worked in the daytime. I went to school at night. I worked at night. I went to school in the day. I raised my son. We adopted a, my, my second husband and I adopted a, a, a baby. And I had to work like there was no tomorrow. And it, in essence, I felt like there was no tomorrow because tomorrow was never guaranteed. Okacha died at 28. So what made me think I was going to live to be really old? I had no idea, but I figured I better work really hard, accomplish what I said I was going to do, and hurry up and do it. Because that's, that's who I am. <laughs> that's what I had to do. So I did manage. Things have worked out. I ran a group home for delinquent boys. I've had a cleaning business in Hollywood. I taught at taught, uh, the university. I, um, I was a road manager for an African band. And I substitute taught in Los Angeles School District for 13 years. When it came time to retire, I said, well, now is my time to go back to Kenya. I better make it happen. So I started coming. In 2000, I started coming on a regular basis. Every year I was here. And one of my relatives, over on Takawiri said, you know, we keep seeing your face. You keep coming here. It's time for you to build your house. I said, oh, OK. I'll build my house. But <laughs> Polo Village didn't have a fence, and it didn't have a show, and it didn't have any water, and it didn't have any people, and it was sort of dead. And I said, you know, I think I better find my own land and build my own place. And some of my young relatives helped me find my, my plot. And while I was coming back, uh, every time people saw me, either my relatives, my, my neighbors, and friends that I made, they would say to me, oh, I'm so glad you're here. Please find me a sponsor. I'm so glad you're here. Please find me a donor. Won't you start an NGO? Gee, I need money for school. And I just said, oh my god, I need money too. What am I going to do? I'm only one person. How can I, how can I help? But I looked around. And I saw the Rusinga Lodge. And I said, there's an idea. This is a beautiful place. People come to see it. They come to love it. And they go to the Rusinga Lo Island Lodge, and they spend a lot of money. So why don't I try to build something? I'll just start my home. And then it'll kind of expand. And I can do a bed and breakfast. And well, you know, <laughs> history is kind of a funny thing. You look back and you wonder. But uh, I realized that I needed to set a good example for my relatives. Because entrepreneurship and creating things and developing your, 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 your home, developing your village, is something that we, we can all do. Even if you're poor, and even if you're poor like me, because I didn't have a big nest egg. I didn't have a big income. I had a teacher's retirement, which is very little money. So anyway, I decided to just build my home. And I learned some things along the way, 
permaculture people came to me and said, we'd like to teach you some things. And I embraced the permaculture uh, process and I started to love it and I started loving the trees and the ground and the water and the lake and organic vegetables and all of those things. And Wyando Beach Eco Lodge was born kept expanding and expanding and expanding. And now it, it's, it's on TripAdvisor, and now it's in Airbnb, and now it's on Lonely Planet. <laughs> so, but the big thing is, I think some people are copying me, and it's okay. Because what I said was, please copy me, please steal my idea. Come and ask me, I'll tell you how I did it. And I wanted, wanted people to start thinking in terms of how can I grow my own business? How can I make my own money? How can I sustain my own self without sticking my hand out all the time, asking everybody to give me this, give me this, give me this. I know things are tough, and I try to help when I can, but I can't always help. So I wanted to set that example with my own work, and I worked hard like I, like I have no tomorrow because it I said it's not guaranteed, but I think I can relax a little bit now, and, but I'm going to keep working. So what I wanted to, to end up with was just to say that I looked at my life and I realized there were lessons along the way, and those lessons were the things that have sustained me. Uh, be true to your word, work like you have no tomorrow, know your own heart, trust your own mind, and believe in yourself. I'm just that example of those kinds of things. And I hope that everyone else can look at their own life and get those lessons that they need because they're, they're all there. So I think that's the end of, oh, plus, I have to tell you, I've had a lot of supporters who really believed in me and I have to give them credit. Uh, my workers and my guests and my volunteers and the people who've come to me with good ideas and Future Pump, solar, and they're not here. <laughs> they brought me a solar pump, which I bought, of course, but it works on the sun, and I don't have to buy petrol every day. And I can water my garden, and I can water my garden. It's amazing. So there are things out there that you can keep learning, and that's, I guess, the last thing I should say. Let's keep learning, because there's new stuff all the time, and it'll, it'll just be wonderful. All right, thank you very much.